Hey everybody, welcome to the final, final notes for sectionalism. Reminder, you should have your notes out that look like this. And we're going to continue talking about the South here for part three. The exciting conclusion. I don't know if it's that exciting, but the conclusion. All right, so first off. Southern economy is different than the northern economy, right? Like we talked about, the northern economy relies on industry and things like this. Well, the South operates under a cash crop economy. That's pretty much how the South has been since colonial times. Um, some things have changed uh, in what goods are being made. Tobacco, still a big seller, but tobacco is not the main thing that's being grown in the South. The main thing is going to be cotton all right and that was already kind of starting but um cotton's a tough plant to grow and when it grows it doesn't come out as like the sweet fluffy stuff that feels good on your skin and shirts and stuff it actually has like all these seeds in it that are really coarse and sharp so uh in order to actually sell cotton to anybody who would want it to then you know use it to produce things like a shirt, for example, um, you're going to have to spend a lot of time and effort picking out all of those seeds individually, hand by hand, so much so that it's almost not going to be worth the time to grow a whole lot of cotton. Well, in the late 1700s, there's a guy named Eli Whitney who was traveling through the South. He was actually a northerner and kind of an inventor and a uh, curious guy. And he invented a machine called the cotton gin. Gin is short for engine. I don't know. I don't know why it was called the cotton engine either, but it was. So the cotton gin. And basically what it was is you could like crank it and it would uh, send the cotton through and it would take the seeds out for you because there was a bar with like a bunch of teeth in it that would rotate and like filter out those seeds. So now what used to take like an hour for one um, slave to get done with by hand to get like a pound of cotton, they could get, you know, 100 pounds of cotton or whatever. I, I don't know the exact numbers. You can look those up. You can watch videos about the cotton gin, look it up on YouTube, and they'll tell you things like that. But just know it's a lot more efficient. And it spelled profits. And Eli Whitney just kind of invented this on a woman. It was like, oh, maybe I should patent that. But even by the time he did that, it had been copied by all the neighbors of the place where he was staying, and it spread all across the South really quickly. Uh, there are people who will argue that slavery was probably even on its way out before the cotton gin was invented because there wasn't a good profitable way. You would actually, as a owner of a business, make more money with free labor. Um, I don't know if that's really true. Just some people say it so. Uh, it's an argument to be made. No one knows if it's true. It's counterfactual. It didn't happen. This did happen. So, um, yeah, I put it right there. Cotton gin made uh, cotton cultivation more efficient, allowed one slave to do work that had formerly taken dozens. Okay, so that meant you could use more of your land to grow more cotton because you can have your slaves doing that um, when it only takes one person to be on the cotton gin. So many planters are going to make their fortunes. Um, growing cotton in the 1800s. And there's a saying that cotton is king. Um, yeah, put that right there. There you go. I made this a year ago. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, most Southern money is tied up either in land, slaves, or cotton. And again, it's not a lot of uh, farmers who are able to get into this class. This is the planter class. So we're talking like 1% to 5% of the population uh, is actually like the owners of plantation economy. But a lot of other people are um, going to still benefit in uh, far off ways from that. So uh, there are exceptions to everything I tell you when I try and generalize about, you know, one section of the country with 22 million people and the other section of the country with 9 million people. So we talk about the North as this big industrial place, and it is becoming a more of a big industrial place. We talk about the South not having a whole lot of cities, and they really didn't, but they did have some. So oddly enough, there's a city called Richmond, Virginia. It's going to be really important. Mark it down. It's about 100 miles from Washington, D.C., and if uh, the South were going to try and make its own country, um, 
in the North is going to continue using the federal government apparatus of the United States. You would think it would be weird if the two uh, capitals were only 100 miles apart in a direct line. But here we are. And this is still the capital of Virginia today, the city of Richmond. But they actually had the largest ironworks in America, even though that's technically in the South. Um, the South didn't develop a railroad system as extensive as the North, didn't try and modernize the economy as much. And basically, the economy is summed up in this phrase, King Cotton. Um, even with that, there are Southerners who are making other things. We know the cash crops that are grown in the South, right? We know that from our doodle notes. So cotton's a big one, but also rice and indigo. Tobacco is still a big deal, as you can imagine. But if you wanted to make the big bucks, you're in the deep South, you're growing um, cotton. Okay, and even when we get to the eve of the Civil War, there are people in the South, in the Confederacy, who say that uh, Great Britain values American cotton so much they will join the war against the United States. It doesn't happen, but they think that. That just tells you how important cotton is to this economy. All right, so view on tariffs. Okay. Um, Southerners dislike tariffs, so there's a few reasons for this. Um, basically, if you're not interested in growing your manufacturing, if you're not interested in, um, and that's the type of tariffs we're talking about, because you can tariff anything. Uh, you can tariff like other farm goods and things, but if you're not interested in tariffing, or sorry, in growing your manufacturing, the types of tariffs they were passing in the 1800s don't help you. They hurt you. So remember, even if you pass a tariff and the American goods are there, the European goods are still there, but um, the American manufacturer isn't going to be able to lower their prices. So you just have two more expensive things where you used to have a cheap option and an expensive option. Now you have an expensive option and a less expensive option. Um, and you're probably going to still buy the American goods. So hooray for that. But... As far as you as a consumer, that's not really helpful. The tariff doesn't help you at all. No one is setting up factories in the South except for that big exception that I just told you about. But um, you just want to be able to buy the cheapest luxuries, manufactured goods, those types of things that do come from a factory. And especially if you're running a plantation, uh, you're going to need things like uh, plows and various other uh metal made objects like that you can't just get you can't make you will need to get them from overseas or from the north um so you're not really you don't care about protecting industry um and most southerners don't you care about making sure that you can uh create your own crops for as you know cheap of a price as possible and if you also think about it, sometimes if you put up a tariff, uh, it's possible the other guy will tariff you. Well, where is this cotton being sent? It's being sent not only to the north. It is being sent to the north, but also to Europe. So there's a chance the Europeans, if you are not being good business partners in the United States, they might start looking for other cotton sources out there. So they might lose their customers too. Um, but they basically just want the cheap foreign goods Okay, they care about those trade connections with Europe. Uh, there's not a lot of immigration to the South. Now, this is not shocking, and it's not because, like, in the North, where there's a whole political party, the Know Nothings, they're mostly going to be in the North and, like, the Western states. Um, I mean, Kentucky and Tennessee will have some, and so whether you consider that Southern or not, it's whatever. But there's not a lot of immigration to the South because there's not a lot of jobs to be had in the South. A lot of people born there can't uh secure a good job like born free i mean because you're competing with slave labor so um and renting slaves was a thing so even if you have something that you need done on your farm or plantation or whatever um that would maybe traditionally be a wage labor job you could rent slaves to do that um there's not a lot of opportunity for immigration to the south doesn't mean it never happened but it's not like the North, which is seeing a huge influx in those German and Irish immigrants. Most of them, 
the vast majority aren't heading south because there's not a lot of opportunity for them there. Okay, they wouldn't be able to afford land for a homestead to farm and they won't be able to get a job in some of these cities. Now, every city is going to have its share of immigration just by the concentration of people. So you still have like Charleston and New Orleans, um, but it's not not the same. Uh, so there's very little immigration leading up and uh, most immigrants either work their own land if they have the money to buy it and or they uh, work in cities. But basically, slavery is going to keep immigrants from wanting to come to your place. There's not good jobs for them to have because those are already taken by enslaved people. All right. So religious and moral views. This one's pretty interesting in the South. So with the rural nature of Southern society, churches are super important. Now, churches are super important in all of America at this time, uh, like I talked about. Uh, but in the South, with everyone living so spread out, um, a lot of times a town would be built around a church. And there would be a few people who like live in town, maybe like a shop and stuff, maybe. But if most people are out living on homesteads, living on land that they rent or own, uh, sometimes the only time you see anyone other than your neighbors is every Sunday at church. And that would be like it. Um, and so basically you're going to church and it's everything. It is your religious needs fulfilled. It is your community needs fulfilled. It's where you get your news. It's like everything. And many Southern preachers, preachers, um, practicing their faith, they look to reinforce their worldview. So they look for a natural view of the world with lots of hierarchies in it. Um, and a lot of times the sermons would be very political and very supportive of things like slavery and the natural way of the world or, you know, railing against an oppressive federal government, whatever it might be. Um, interestingly, it's not on here, but if you're talking about the uh, religion of the slaves, um, they part of the kind of um character that Southern planters thought of themselves as was as, you know, a Christianizing force to their slaves, but they would tend to focus on, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The story is all about like being obedient, listening to your master, doing what you're told. I know you're shocked. Uh, but slaves, you can imagine one of the most popular, the most popular stories they talked about were things like Moses, which is a story in the Bible about leading a group of slaves away from slavery. Um, and they knew about those stories. They talked about them. And uh, when it was a slave preacher and not a white preacher, they would preach that. Uh, representation and population. The South was supposed to, was far outpaced by the North as far as population, like we talked about, um, mainly because there's not a lot of room for urbanization and growing of cities. With the three-fifths compromise, the South still holds some sway in the House of Representatives, but really has to rely on the Senate to make sure that uh, there's a balance between free and slave states and that they aren't just overwhelmed by the uh, North. And if you want to be president in the 1800s, you still have to be able to appeal to both North and South, which is going to be increasingly hard to do. All right, so what are we going to make of all this? Um, basically you got two different sides going, going on who have to share one form of government, which is not a very easy thing for them to do. And so, uh, we're going to be destined for conflict, which is pretty problematic, uh, as you can imagine. And we'll talk all about that in our next unit, but that's the setup for sectionalism.